Hey guys, I got a recent question to uh, do a quick summary of some partial failure scenarios. I thought it was really solid. It's actually a really important topic. Uh, it's it's a it's a pretty crucial topic for senior SDE interviews. Actually, is partial failure scenarios. Uh, I heard a saying once that I think holds really true. It's that junior engineers and mid-level engineers, perhaps a little bit, will design for uh, the happy path, while senior SDEs design for outages and basically the end of the world. Uh, not really, but it's a it's a little joke there. Um, so uh, yeah, let's cover a couple of different snares that you'll see in uh, your system design interviews. And then uh, my uh, longer term uh, viewers that have been on my Discord channel for a while will know that I like to kind of do my own stunts with the uh, coverage on some of my system design interviews, uh, the, the, the content coverage. Um, so the fourth one is, uh, it's, it's usually, you're not going to have hands on the, the, the ability to directly access your second database. And so in the real world, you might have to kind of, um, do something a little bit special. And so I just kind of threw my own idea into there for, uh, for, uh, scenario four, and we'll cover that at the end. It'll just be a, a fun extra thing for what I think might be a little bit more realistic in the real world. Uh, I'd love to see some thoughts on that in the comments in uh, below the video. I, it might be a terrible idea. Uh, I would love to see somebody tell me that it is a terrible idea, but I don't know. It seems to look out. It seems to work out for now. Okay, with that uh, scenario one, let it fail. Uh, so with the recent video I did on tiny URL. Uh, we saw that there's a durable data storage and there is a short link uh, cache. And so uh, let's say that you uh, write to the, the durable store and then it, it uh, fails that the node goes out before you write to the cache. Uh, you can just go ahead and let that happen. It, it just isn't really going to break a whole lot of stuff. You'll just have some garbage that will accumulate in the DB. Um, so uh, you can have an outage either uh, between the uh, this event happening, the, the right to this and the right to this, or you can even have the outage happen after the right to the cache and before you even return success to the writer, is um, you're just gonna have some, some garbage accumulate in your DB. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll go through this a little bit more deeper. So the, the request comes in, you write to here, and then you're supposed to write to the cache afterwards. Um, but you know you have failure before that, and so it doesn't make it in, the whole uh, node goes down, uh, you don't get your response. So the client just has to uh, retry their uh, request for a URL, uh, no big deal. Um, you might display a, a, um, an error message like, hey, we failed to generate your, your shortened link, uh, please try again. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's not really the end of the world. Um, you can just go ahead and let it fail. There's some scenarios where you can't. Uh, an example is, for example, the uh, payment service or wallet service or stock exchange problems from Alcatraz's second book, which we kind of have covered over here. It's distributed transactions. Um, so sometimes uh, you can't let it fail with just one side. You have to do a full distributed transaction. Um, another option, though, is um, if you if you manage to make your rights item potent you can go ahead and do retries. So I have that over here in the second diagram. Uh, these diagrams are from, uh, along the numbers. They are left to right, by the way. Um, so I have scenario one is over here, two is over here, and then three I've covered in both of these diagrams. And then my fun one that we're gonna cover at the end is over here on the right. Okay, so uh, if uh, you wanna try to make it a little bit better than just letting it fail is that you can make it item potent. You can make the rights to the DBs item potent and you can just do retries until it makes it through there. Uh, this of course means that you're gonna have eventual consistency, but if you're allowed to make it item potent and you can have eventual consistency, then just going ahead and, and uh, doing retries off the message broker is a pretty solid approach. And so uh, you have your request come in, you stick it on the broker, uh, and then it immediately returns back a, uh, it's like, yep, I got it. I've got your message on the broker. We'll, uh, we'll process it later. And then you return 200 success to the client. Um, and so then you're going to have a task runner that's going to pull the message off the broker. And then it's going to try and persist both. And it will not return a success back to the broker unless it manages to complete the task. So it is going to keep retrying a message until it manages to do both. Um, so we'll go through uh, a failure scenario. 
is um, so you got your your runner, your task runner. It takes a message off. It uh, does a write to the durable store, and then next it's going to try the short link. It fails. Uh, the node has uh, it has um, died in the middle of the operation, so the message was not successfully processed. So there's going to be a new task runner that'll boot up. It'll, it'll take the message off the broker again. Uh, I will retry this message. It'll write to the durable store. It's already there. It's an item potent operation, so that's fine that it's already there since it's item potent. And then it'll write to the cache. Uh, and now we've got it written to both. It'll return back success to the broker. And so that means it'll either, for, for SQS, uh, it means that it'll delete the message and mark it as processed. Uh, if it's Kafka or Kinesis or a stream, uh, you're going to close it out as successfully processed by updating the offset. Um, and so it's going to keep retrying the message until you have either marked it as complete in RabbitMQ or SQS, or you update the offset for Kafka or Kinesis. So it's not always an option to make an operation item potent. Sometimes um, you can't make an operation item potent. A um, good example is that um, it's kind of hard to design um, the wallet service or a payment service to be item potent that might result in double charges or in, in dropped charges or something like that. And so uh, you, you want both to either go all the way through or for both to fail. And so the naive approach to doing that, uh, it's, it's you've got to use a distributed transaction and uh, the naive approach is uh, two-phase commit. So you have your request come in, you want to do a payment uh, from one user to another, or you want to, you want to place an order um, and so you need to update that user's wallet to deduct a balance and you want to place the order. You need both to happen or you need neither to happen. Um, so you use a two-phase commit. Phase one is the prepare phase. You have both nodes um, say, both, both databases say, uh, yep, I'm going to uh, um, prepare the transaction. Um, so usually that entails ro uh, locking the records so that nobody else can touch them during the transaction. Um, so they both do a prepare, they both lock the records, they return back success. And then uh, the second phase is the actual commit. And so then the coordinator says to both, okay, go ahead and do the actual transaction. And so it says to both, uh, so this one does the transaction, this one does the transaction. And so then if there's a, an issue in either of them in either phase one or phase two, if it's in phase one, they both just don't do it. Um, so uh, this one says, yep, I can do it. This one says, nope. Then um, the right capture service, or if it's even offline completely, it can't even say anything back for whatever reason, then uh, this one talks to the other and it says, um, hey, don't do the transaction. So it unlocks the records and it returns back um, a 500 or a 400 or something. Um, the other case is they both prepare. And then uh, in the second phase, this one's a success. And then this one's a failure comes back and this one says, um, hey, uh, roll back the transaction to the order DB. And so um, this one failed, it rolled it back, it couldn't do the transaction. And then this one tells the other one, hey, you can't do the transaction either, roll it back. Um, so uh, yeah, and in this case, the, the machine itself and the, the service, you, you actually write the code in your own service for running the two-phase commit. Um, so it's, it's, uh, if you run a transaction on a, on a database, like PostgreSQL or something, usually the transaction is the, the code for handling that is of course, within the DB implementation details and the internals of the database. But if it's distributed and you have like different technologies used across both of these, like for example, this one is, um, Cassandra or something. And then this one is, uh, let's say DynamoDB, you know, those are two completely different technologies. Um, they can't really talk to each other really well. So you need to do the talking between them on their behalf. And so uh, uh, in, uh, in PostgreSQL, for example, it actually has an API exposed for running a two-phase commit. I think a lot of different database solutions have a thing where it's like they're here, you can set up a prepare and then you can do the actual transaction run. Um, and so you have the actual code here for running the two-phase commit since you can't have it in these um, heterogeneous technologies of like Cassandra and DynamoDB, for instance. Um, so this was the naive approach. Uh, the better approach is to use something like Paxos or Raft or some kind of uh, distributed consensus algorithm. And um, it's a really bad idea to roll those yourself. Um, in fact, it's kind of like rolling your own crypto algorithm, your own encryption algorithm. Uh, you're supposed to leave those for the expert. 
uh, because it's easy to screw it up and just totally um, screw up the implementation completely. Uh, Two-phase commit is more primitive. It's a little bit harder to screw up, um, although I've, I've heard from uh, teams at Amazon that rolled it themselves that um, the code for two-phase commit still turned out to be a little bit more complex relative to the rest of their code base. Um, Paxos is way more complicated. You definitely don't want to roll it to yourself. Uh, there's actually advice in uh, designing data intensive applications by uh, Kleppman that can actually outsource that code to specialized software for running it, like Zookeeper, for example. And so um, it'll actually be that specialized software that will run uh, the coordination um, stuff for you on, on your behalf. You just outsource all the code to uh, existing software that has it written. You don't roll your own Paxos implementation or whatever. And so that's what it looks like over here is that you have a request come in, you make a call to Zookeeper, and then Zookeeper does its Paxos thing, or it's, it's Zab in this case. Uh, Zookeeper's consensus algorithm is Zab. And so it's going to do its uh, calls to the order DB and the wallet DB on your behalf. Uh, they'll return back a success or a failure, and then it'll communicate that over your write service, and then you communicate that back. And these should be consistent. Um, it'll it'll keep you it consistent for you. You don't have to handle any logic over here. You're just talking to Zookeeper, and it talks to these two on your behalf. Okay, um, but you're not necessarily always going to have um, these two databases um, exposed. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're working with another team and you you think that uh, what if you know you do your transaction over here, and then you're working with this external service. And you're there if, if you're working with another team and it's it's call is going to be mixed in with a bunch of your own calls. Um, the other team is likely not going to be okay with exposing their database directly to your team so that you can talk directly to their DB. Um, that's that's generally a bad practice. It's it's uh, it's it's bad to use um, a database as a communications channel, and a lot of teams are not going to be a fan of letting you talk to their database directly. And so my idea is that you can just sandwich the, the external service call right between your phase one and phase two of your own. And so you would just have this um, two external call and then you have your three commit. And so it's almost like you're, you're doing the two phase commit without their knowledge because this is actually, it's, it's, um, it's, um, you, you're not doing explicit phase one and phase two, but if you could think of it as um, 2A and 2B, where it's the external call um, prepare, and then you have the external call commit, you know, if you explicitly ordered the prepare phases of your DB calls and your, your, your commit phases, like over here, if you did um, the prepare call first to here, then you do a prepare call to here, and then you do your commit call to here and then the commit call to the order DB. It looked kind of like that. Um, and so it's, it's not actually doing explicit prepare and commit phase with this. It's it still is going to be an all or nothing, which is what you want. But so you're, you're locking the records here and then you're having this one do a transaction or it's, it's uh, you're calling that service and you're either going to get back a success or failure from that service. And then you're going to do your commit over here. And so you can do a two-phase commit, I feel, without actually having the external service uh, that you do not own, um, uh, knowing of you doing this. It's it's sometimes is really so when all that Amazon, it sometimes is really hard to work with uh, teams in different orgs, and so I feel like this is probably a way to kind of. Um, do uh, a two-phase commit without full cooperation of the other team. You don't even really have to talk to them at all. You can probably roll this. Um, it'd be great if they exposed endpoints, API endpoints for doing a prepare and commit to their DB. That's that's what you would need is if, if you don't do something like this is that you would, you would have to have their external service expose a prepare endpoint and a commit endpoint, uh, um, like API endpoint in their service for uh, getting their DB to do that. I think. And so then um, it, that would be a lot of work and you'd have to talk to them to do that. But uh, if you don't, if you can't get them to do that, or, you know, if the, if the team's not known for being super 
Um, collaborative, uh, you might be able to do a trick like this where you just do a prepare on your own DB, just call them normally, and then you do your commit if their call succeeded. If their call failed, you just kill your prepare off of this, or you just, you know, you don't do the commit, you just unlock those records and it's like, okay, that's the, that's the rollback. If they failed, don't do the transaction over here. Um, so I feel like that's a hack for getting around that. Um, I've never seen this done before, but I think it's something that would work. It might be a, a nice way to, to um, you know, get your own two-phase commit without having to go through some extra hoops. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see some thoughts on, on four, but um, one through three, those are very traditional um, system design interview scenarios that you see a lot. And then four is just me kind of doing my own stunts and, um, I've, I've actually seen two-phase commit a lot at Amazon. It's apparently good enough for them, even under very, very high call volumes. I've never actually seen any, anyone roll Zookeeper or doing a proper Paxos or RAF transaction. Well, it uses Zap because it's Zookeeper. Um, two-phase commit seems like it's typically good enough at Amazon. So uh, you could probably usually leave it at that. I've, I've never actually heard of anyone doing this at Amazon. I'd love for somebody to correct me in the comments of the video, but uh, yeah. All right. Um, thanks. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video. See ya.